A few months ago, we visited this town, Trostinets, shortly after Russian forces who occupied the area had been pushed back. At the time, we discovered that civilians were being abducted, tortured and detained in an underground chamber below this railway station behind me. The police said that they had a long list of people who were missing. Now, it seems that at least one of those civilians has reappeared with information about others who vanished. He's agreed to come on camera and tell us his story. This is Andre. It's not his real name. He's asked that we protect his identity. On the 12th of March, at the height of the Russian occupation of his hometown, he was getting food supplies with his father-in-law when a Russian military vehicle pulled up next to them. At that point, citizens in this town had started going missing. Andre, a furniture maker, and his father-in-law didn't know at the time, but they would be next. Soldiers blindfolded and handcuffed the two men and took them to the railway station. Here, they accused them of colluding with the Ukrainian military and said that they would be taken to Russia. They were beaten so badly, Andre's father-in-law had to have stitches. Andre says they were subjected to mock executions and were repeatedly interrogated about Ukrainian military positions, despite being civilians. They ended up in a prison in Stary Oskol, a town about 180 kilometers deep into Russia. There, they were surprised to meet many other jailed Ukrainian civilians. All of them had also been abducted from their hometowns and held in secret. Andre is back home now. On the 18th of April, he was released in a prisoner swap. He still doesn't know why. His father-in-law and his fellow cellmates remain behind bars. Andre's testimony is one of many we've heard traveling throughout Ukraine, where thousands of people have vanished in Putin's invasion of the country. Speaking to dozens of witnesses and family members of victims, we've uncovered what could be fresh evidence of war crimes, including forcible transfer, enforced disappearance, torture and forced labour. We've also managed to relay information to two families about their missing children. Russia has repeatedly denied committing any crimes in Ukraine and has accused Kyiv of deliberately staging atrocities to win international support. Moscow did not respond to our requests for comments. But in the last few months, we've tracked missing civilians from near the southern port cities of Kherson and Mariupol, right up through the occupied east of the country to Ukraine's northern borders. Tell you about the official figures. So we had around 25,000 written requests to the national police about the missing person. But half of these people were found. It means that right now we have 12.5 thousand people who are still missing. In that information blackout, one of the only ways for Ukrainian families to get news of their missing loved ones is from prisoners like Andre, who are released. One of the numbers scribbled on that scrap of paper he smuggled out of the prison was Maria's. She's from a village near Trostinets. On the 17th of March, Russian soldiers raided her home and took her husband, who was a construction worker. She hasn't heard from him since. The first news she had of her husband's fate was from Andre after he was released. После 17 березня в мене вся жизнь опустилася вниз. Пустота, 
Я не одной ночи не сплю до сих пор. Целыми ночами дивлюсь я в телефоны, какую-то информацию, может, про обмены, может, где-то что-то, кто-то напишет. Не мама не, не спокойствует меня ничего. Все ушло с под ног. Вся жизнь. Нема страха, я скажу. Страх ушел. Осталась только пустота в душе. Andre says he managed to reach every family of his cellmates, except for a young man who we'll call Igor. He also vanished in March from his area in northern Kharkiv. It seems Igor, a humanitarian volunteer, had forgotten to write down his family's details, but we had a breakthrough. Well, we've been trawling through the posts about missing people, and we've actually managed to locate Igor's parents, who are in Kharkiv. So we're actually on our way to the city right now to relay the information that we've learned, and hopefully for them, shed some light on the fate of their son. We meet Igor's parents and are able to confirm their worst suspicions that their son is indeed in prison in Russia. That was the last word that they'd had until we relayed Andrei's news. But the news Igor is being held in Stary Oskol brings them little comfort. Two million Ukrainians have been sent to Russia, according to both Ukrainian and Russian officials. Moscow claims that these Ukrainians chose to come to the country and has presented the movement of people as efforts to save lives caught up in the fighting. Kyiv says they were forcibly transferred, which is a potential war crime. Not all of those who ended up in Russia were arrested, though. The majority went through filtration after their villages, towns and cities were overrun by the conflict. The United Nations and human rights groups have repeatedly raised their concerns about this process, warning there's a high likelihood of people being subjected to torture or ill treatment. We spoke to several Ukrainians who've gone through filtration. Among them was Nadia, who spoke to us via phone. She's in her 70s and was evacuated by Russian proxy soldiers from Mariupol. She was put through filtration with her disabled son and says she was sent to Russia against her will. Olga, who we meet at a reception centre for those who fled Mariupol, says the filtration process is frightening and unpredictable. Да, это очень страшно, потому что ты не знаешь, выпустят тебя или не выпустят, и вообще нет никакой информации про фильтрацию. Тебе никто не говорит, что там будет, как это происходит, какие задают вопросы и что происходит дальше. То есть это до последнего неизвестность, непонятно, тебя выпускают, тебя не выпускают, тебя забирают или нет. Ты проходишь всей семьей, это страшно, потому что непонятно, что произойдет дальше. Those who do not pass filtration usually end up in detention centers across occupied parts of the country. Among them is a camp called Olenivka. Little was known about Olenivka until July, when Moscow announced that 53 Ukrainian prisoners of war had burned to death there in an explosion. Moscow blamed Kyiv, saying it had deliberately shelled its own POWs to stop them talking about alleged crimes they'd committed. Kyiv said it was a false flag attack to cover up abuses there. Whatever happened, the explosion threw a global spotlight on the notorious prison. Former civilian detainees that we interviewed told us of torture, terrible conditions, and forced labor there. Among them is Vitaly and Alexei, who we meet in Poland, where they are recuperating from their ordeal. They were arrested by Russian soldiers whilst trying to rescue civilians from Mariupol. They were held in Comunicado for a hundred days beaten and put to work renovating the squalid camp. Приблизительно мы так считали уже в районе 6000 должно было пройти в Еленовке. Условия содержания были просто ужасающие. 
находилось в камерах очень много людей от 21 до 55 человек влазило окон почти не было очень не было кислорода изначально давали очень мало воды и практически не давали еды только в дальнейшем ситуация начала улучшаться да, можно, наверное, так сказать. Если и не в аду, то, наверное, это одно из самых ужасных мест, в которых вот нам приходилось бывать за всю нашу жизнь. So Даже не одно из самых ужасных, а самое ужасное место. They worry for their they left нам очень сложно сказать, что будет с этими людьми, потому что все время, пока мы сами находились там, мы абсолютно не знали, выпустят нас или нет. Нам рассказывали очень разные истории, и что нам дадут от 10 лет и выше, что мы там проведем вплоть до того, что всю жизнь. Нам постоянно угрожали этим, постоянно угрожали, тому, ну, что сообщат нашим семьям, что мы погибли. But Alexei and Vitaly are among the lucky few who've been released. Lyudmila's son Dima is believed to still be in Olenivka. Dima, who before the war trained psychologists, was arrested whilst trying to rescue his grandparents from Mariupol. He sent his last message on the 30th of March, asking his mother to pray for him as he approached the city. She hasn't heard anything from him since. No, information Як я вже казала, інформація, що звинувачують в тероризмі і загрожували до 20 років тюрми. Потім сказали, що він тепер військовополонений. Ну, як це? Це незаконно. She spends all day online speaking to other mothers whose sons are also detained. Швидше приїхали додому. Сім'ї свої, в когось з хлопців є діти маленькі, які чекають на тата, мами, які, які я чекають на своїх синів, і дімини, дідусь, бабуся, вони так і не дочекалися допомоги, вони залишаються в Маріуполі, їм дуже важко, і ми не можемо їх забрати, тому я благаю, благаю. Будь ласка, допоможіть. Допоможіть обміняти хлопців. But perhaps the worst fate of all is not knowing where your loved one is. Elena's husband, Serhi, a former soldier turned journalist and activist, was arrested on the morning of the 12th of March from an occupied town in the southern region of Kherson. On the 19th of April, he suddenly appeared on a Russian television channel where Elena says he was criticizing Ukrainian military. She believes he's speaking under duress. She has no idea where he's being held. Я думаю, что Сережа изменил свою точку зрения только под давлением, только насилие могло заставить его сказать эти слова с экрана. И почему именно Сережу использовали для того, чтобы именно он говорил нужные российским войскам слова? Потому что он сам бывший офицер, он знает, как это э, работает. И, возможно, чтобы придать значимость этим словам, этой информации, использовали именно его, а не обычного украинского человека. This short video is the only proof that she has that he's still alive. Other anti-occupation activists who were also arrested in Kherson have spoken about their horrific treatment. Maxim says he was held for 10 days in an underground basement and so badly tortured they broke his ribs. Так, справді це гірше за пекло, тому що не сам одна секунда тягнеться як ціла вічність, а цих секунд повно. Більше того, влякає не лише реальність, а й нерозуміння, що буде далі, про якогось думка, що, ну, вірогідніше це все ж смерть. Від надлишку адреналіну навіть не так сильно відчуваєш цей біль від переламаних кісток і чогось такого. With so few ways of getting any information, families have teamed up with human rights groups to try to piece together what happened. One initiative is the Center of Civil Liberties in Kyiv. They use online forms and social media groups to try to pull together reports. We received uh, the info about the um, exact location from a released person 
and also from uh, families because you you know um, mothers and sisters and I don't know brothers yeah uh, they trying to to look for their uh, father I don't know other relatives. relatives yeah and uh, they when they find out any information they call us and say Ivanka uh, I know that uh, he is capturing in Kursk for example and so you're basically using open source information like Facebook, mm. Telegram chats. Yeah, but women. also, uh, <clears throat> but also we launched the Google form, and people uh, can fill it, and write all info that uh, they know about the captured person or uh, disappeared yeah, person. Ivanka says they've put together a database of hundreds of missing civilians. The youngest is just 16 years old. It's a grueling process trying to find any information. It's hard. I, I can't explain because, um, sorry, all these stories going th through you, you know, and all times when I received the calls from families, from relatives. Yeah, that's really hard, but um, we have a lot of work to do. And there are no guarantees that people will be found alive. All they can do is pray for good news and wait for the day their loved ones come home. Мы уже с сыном четыре месяца ждем, хотя бы что-нибудь каждый день на телефон слухаем, и день и ночь, чтобы позвонить, что нашего папу уже возвращает до дома.